Hey guys, Jim here with another video for you. This is 50 Years in Film, 1999. But before we begin, at the end of this video, if you like what you see, please consider giving me a thumbs up, a possible subscribe, and most importantly, please leave comments below. Let me know how you feel about this channel, how you feel about this series, and how you feel about these movies in general. Now, before we begin, we'll issue the usual caveats. These are not all of the films from 1999, far from it. These are simply the titles that I own on Blu-ray. I am not including any other films that I own on physical media or that I do not own. The second caveat is that this is not a ranking video. This is just simply, again, a recap of the films that came out that year that I happen to have in my collection on Blu-ray. Now, at the end of this video, I am going to give you some details about how we're going to proceed uh, with the series going forward. But we are halfway through, chronologically, the years of the series. We started in 1974. Right now, we're on 1999. So, just like the last couple of years, I don't have a whole lot of titles from this year. In this particular case, I have 14. But we have some very, very iconic titles, and it's a very eclectic mix. So without further ado, let's begin. We're going to start off with animation. And first we have Toy Story 2, featuring the voices of Tim Allen, Tom Hanks, Kelsey Grammer, among many others. Directed by John Lasseter, who also directed the original. Toy Story 2 is one of those miracle sequels that it's just as good as the original. This is a wonderful, wonderful film. It was a huge hit. And again, like certain other franchises from the 90s, this one is in no hurry to end anytime soon. It would not surprise me at all if they come out with another Toy Story film within the next year or two. But as it is, the original and especially Toy Story 2, are absolutely wonderful films. Next, The Iron Giant. Directed by Brad Bird, who would go on to direct The Incredibles, among others. Featuring the voices of Jennifer Aniston, Harry Connick Jr., and Vin Diesel. This, again wonderful wonderful film it's a throwback to the old animation style type of style that they don't really do anymore <clears throat> very simple story but it's a beautiful story and vin diesel who does the voice of the robot really doesn't talk too much but when you hear the word superman after watching this movie in his voice i you'll be hard pressed not to have a tear in your eye the Iron Giant is a wonderful film. But our third animated film, and this, Lord help me, this one's my favorite. <laughs> South Park. Bigger, longer, and uncut. Written by Matt Stone and Trey, and Trey Parker. Directed by Trey, Trey Parker. They are the creators of South Park, the TV show. And they do uh, most of the voices. However, there is a voice cameo in here from George Clooney. And, oh my God, I love South Park. I was a huge fan of the show when it came on. And I thought the show pushed every envelope it could possibly push. And when I heard that they were making a movie, I thought, okay, cash grab, whatever. But I did. I went and saw it the day it came out. And they had signs posted everywhere around the lobbies about how rough this movie was and that it was rated R and that you should not bring your children to see it. And yet when we went in, I would say 15% of the audience were little kids. And just like in the movie where they're watching asses of fire and people are walking out complaining, that's exactly what happened in real life. People were dragging their kids out left and right. Oh my God. I was laughing my ass off. Art really does imitate life, but South park bigger, longer and uncut is absolutely hysterical it is not politically correct. It is outrageous. It is disgusting. It is everything that I should absolutely hate about a movie. I love this movie. One of the best musicals ever. 
And then we're going to go to dramas. We're going to start off with my best picture collection. And the winner of best picture that year, American Beauty. Directed by Sam Mendes. Starring Kevin Spacey, Annette Benning, and Mina Saveri. Very controversial film. This movie has not aged well, but I still really enjoy it. And Kevin Spacey, again, very divisive figure. Everybody has an opinion on him. I try to separate the artist from the art, and he gives an incredible performance in this movie, and he totally deserved his Oscar for this film. Again, I don't like American Beauty as much as some of the other best pictures in, in this collection in particular, but I still do enjoy the mo movie. So that's American Beauty. Continuing with the dramas, Stanley Kubrick's final film, Eyes Wide Shut. Starring Tom Cruise, Nicole Kidman, and Sidney Pollack. This is a very, very, very strange movie. When I saw this theatrically originally, I didn't like it, quite honestly. It left me cold. And quite frankly, that's the way I felt about most of Kubrick's films the first time I saw it. But then I did go back and I watched this a couple of years later. And I still didn't enjoy it all that much, but I did enjoy it a little bit more. I've seen this movie now about four or five times. And every time I watch it, I do admit I enjoy it just a little bit more. It is my least favorite of the Kubrick's films that I have in my collection, but it's still an extremely well-made film, well-acted. It's just a little slow, but it's a Kubrick film, so you know it's of the highest quality. And then we have The Green Mile, directed by Frank Darabont, written by Frank Darabont based on the book the Green Mile by Stephen King, starring Tom Hanks, David Morse, James Cronwell, and the late Michael Clark Duncan. The Green Mile is a very cynical movie. It knows how to play your emotions. I don't care. It works. I love this movie. I think it's one of the better Stephen King adaptions. And... Frank Darabont is three for three, in my opinion, with the Shawshank Redemption, this film, and The Mist. Him and Rob Reiner have pro and uh, uh, Mike Flanagan, recently, are probably the three best adapters of Stephen King's material to date. And The Green Mile is, it's a great movie. Michael Clark Duncan gives a very, very great performance in this film. Unfortunately, he passed away. This was the first movie that I noticed uh, Rockwell, Sam Rockwell in. He plays a really despicable character in this movie. But my God, I was hoping that they had a picture of him on the back, but they don't. But my God, is he, he's, he's phenomenal in this movie. But The Green Mile is, it's a great movie. I don't put it on the same plane as The Shawshank Redemption because that is a pretty high uh, step to match. But The Green Mile is, it's a great movie. Now we're starting to move slowly from the drama into the action, although this is still basically a drama, a psychological drama, or a black comedy, depending on your point of view. Fight Club, directed by David Fincher, starring Edward Norton, Brad Pitt, Helena Bonham Carter, and Meatloaf. I love this movie. This movie was not a hit when it came out. I saw it in the theater opening weekend. Theater was maybe a half full. And again, like some of these other movies, the first time I saw this movie, I liked it, but it left me cold. I was wondering what the hell it was that I watched, but I couldn't get it out of my head. And then I went and saw it again a couple of weeks later, right before it was gone for the summer, or gone from the theaters completely. And I realized what this movie was. The first time I saw it, I thought it was basically, you know, a straight movie explaining, you know, how men of that age and of that generation felt about society, about consumerism, and how the things in the things that you own define you instead of you defining the things you own. 
But then when I watched it again, I realized this movie is a satire of all that. It makes fun of that type of thinking. It makes fun of the whole id. And yeah, Fight Club is awesome. It's a masterpiece. It is one of Fincher's best films. Continuing in with the drama action, we're back to my Bond set. And in 1999, it was The World Is Not Enough. Starring Pierce Brosnan, Judy Dench, and Robert Carlyle. I don't like this movie. I don't hate it, but I don't like it. The main reason why, and this is going to sound kind of sexist, it's got the worst Bond girl in history. Denise Richards, who I do, I have enjoyed in other movies like Wild Things. She is so miscast in this movie as a nuclear physicist by the name of Dr. Christmas Jones. Really? It makes me pine for the days of Pussy Galore. <laughs> but this movie, quite honestly, I forgot about it 10 minutes after I saw it theatrically. And then I watched all of my Bond movies again uh, to do my ranking video a couple of years ago, or a couple, couple of months ago, sorry. And I gotta admit, just like the first time, completely got it out of my brain like within hours after watching it. Yeah, The World Is Not Enough isn't a horrible movie, but it's definitely not a good one. Okay, continuing with the action, but we're starting to go towards the horror now. Deep Blue Sea. Starring Thomas Jane, Stellan Skarsgård, Samuel Jackson, and LL Cool J. I love this movie. It is so stupid. But it is so much fun. I'll never forget seeing this movie theatrically. The commercials all heavily promoted Samuel Jackson in this movie, made it look like he was the star of the film. And not to be a spoiler, because again, this movie's 25 years old, but when he gets taken out, I gotta admit, that was one of the most unexpected scenes ever, and I loved it. I, I started clapping while I was sitting in my seat at the theater. I love Deep Blue Sea. It is so audacious. It, it is almost like a spoof of Jaws, but it's a lot of fun. Now we're moving into the horror. And again, this is also kind of a black comedy, Ravenous, starring Guy Pearce, Robert Carlyle, Jeremy Davis, David Arquette, Neil McDonough, and many others. This movie's got a great cast. Directed by Antonio Bird. This is a weird movie. It's a cannibalism tale. It's not a zombie movie. It's a cannibalism tale. It is extremely weird. The music is extremely annoying. And again, just like a couple of other films in this list, the first time I saw this movie, I did not really care for it. But I couldn't get it out of my head. And then I watched it on video. And I liked it a little bit more. And then I bought this on Scream Factory, mainly because it was super cheap. And I understand why the transfer on this particular uh, edition is terrible. But I have really fallen in love with this movie. It is so quirky. It is so goofy. But it's a lot of fun. And Guy Pearce and Robert Carlyle are both fantastic in this movie. If you've never seen Ravenous, check it out. And then we've got... House on Haunted Hill, directed by William Malone, starring Jeffrey Rush, Famke Jensen, Ali Larder, and Ty Diggs. This is a remake of a movie from the either late 50s or early 60s, I'm not really sure which, but this movie's fun, okay? Again, it's not going to win any awards, but it's fun, mainly because of Jeffrey Rush and Famke Jensen. The two of them are fantastic in this movie. They play a married couple who truly hate each other, and you could tell the two of them are just having a ball playing these despicable characters. Uh, this is from the same, this was, uh, what is it, Dark Castle, I believe? Yeah, Dark Castle. 
Dark Castle film started around this time. They did a lot of films like uh, House of Wax, House on Haunted Hill, uh, Ghost Ship, uh, 13 Ghosts, a lot of them. This one is actually my favorite out of all of those films. I, I like a couple of those other films. House of Wax is a really good movie. Uh, can't stand Ghost Ship. But again, this movie's fun. And again, the last horror movie, but it's basically a comedy. Lake Placid, starring Bill Pullman, Bridget Fonda, Olivia Platt, Brendan Gleeson, and the wonderful, late, great Betty White. There she is. Directed by Steve Miner. Again, this movie is not scary. It's goofy. It's funny. Betty White is absolutely hysterical in this movie, as is Oliver Platt and uh, Brendan Gleeson. I love the way that those two play off each other. This movie's fun. This makes a really good double feature with Alligator. That's it for the horror. Because 1999 was the year of Star Wars. After 22 years, there was a new Star Wars film in town. The Phantom Menace. Directed by George Lucas. Starring Liam Neeson. Ewan McGregor. And Jar Jar Binks. Phantom Menace was the most anticipated film of the year, and it was also the biggest hit of the year. I actually stood in line for three hours, two weeks before this movie came out, to buy advance tickets for the opening day. I hadn't done that since I was a kid standing in, in line for concert tickets before uh, you could go online. Believe me, I camped out overnight for many concerts in the 80s. <laughs> Good times. But I did. Because I was so excited to see a new Star Wars film. A real new Star Wars film. Not an old one with new footage. Saw it opening day. I enjoyed it. I didn't love it, but I enjoyed it. And then I went back two days later. And I enjoyed it a little bit less. And then it came out on video and I bought it right away. And I enjoyed it a little bit less again. And every time I have watched The Phantom Menace since the first time around, I enjoy it a little less. That's one of the reasons why I don't watch it anymore. It does not hold a candle to any of the original three installments. However, compared to what comes next and what comes further down the road, Phantom Menace is great. But Star Wars Phantom Menace was definitely the most hyped movie of that year and was considered to be the most breakthrough science fiction film yet because of the way that George Lucas filmed it with the CGI and, and all that good stuff. And it was supposed to usher in a new age of science fiction films. They were wrong. Because another, year, another movie was released that year a little bit earlier. From my ultimate Matrix collection, The Matrix. Directed by the Wachowskis, starring Keanu Reeves, Lawrence Fishburne, Joe Pantoliano, Pantoliano, sorry, and I love Joey Pants, and Carrie Ann Moss. The Matrix became the science fiction film of the year, of the decade, and possibly of the last 50 years. I said earlier in one of the earlier videos that nobody got ripped off like uh, Jaws, Aliens, and Tarantino. I forgot about The Matrix. Because again, after this film came out, everybody and their brother tried to imitate the style of The Matrix. Whether visually, or storytelling, or the music, the clothes, everything. Everything ripped off The Matrix immediately following this movie, including themselves. Because this is one of those trilogies that, quite frankly, could have ended after the first installment. Because The Matrix is damn near a perfect film. I'll never forget seeing this the first time. My brain felt like it was melted 
and it would have felt that way even if I was sober. But I will admit, I smoked a big fat joint before I went and watched this movie. Went home, and then I smoked another big fat joint and went back and watched it again. Yes, I saw this movie twice in one day. I love The Matrix. It is without a doubt one of the best films of the 90s. And it's the way that we're ending 1999. I hope you enjoyed this. Now, continuing. I will be going back and doing the same thing that I did last time with the 80s. I'm going to do top 10 lists of the films in my collection two years at a time per video. However, on a couple of those years, I only have about 10 or 11 or 12 titles. So I've made a decision that any year that I have less than 13 titles, I am only going to rank the top five. And that at the end of all of that, I am going to do my top 25. The first installment of that will be released tomorrow. The rest of it will be released sporadically over the next week or two, because as I said in my previous video, my grandson's back in town tomorrow and he's going to be here for the next 10 days. At that point, Rather than going into 2000, we're going to do a couple of specialized videos about the first 25 years of this series. We're going to do a couple of videos about Academy Awards. We're going to do a couple of videos about trends. And we're going to do a couple of videos about the most influential directors and actors during those 25 years. At the end of that little sub, sub journey, we'll continue with the year 2000. However, I've made another decision. Starting with the year 2000 moving forward, I am going to include DVDs with my Blu-rays. Because quite frankly, after going through this for the first half of the series, I've realized that the majority of my Blu-ray collection is from the first 25 years of this series. For the next 5 to 10 years at least, the majority of the films that I own are on DVD. I just have to track them down because they are currently packed up because I ran out of shelf space. So that's another reason why I'm going to take a little bit of time in between these series before I ramp it up again with the year 2000. So I hope you'll continue to join me on this. I hope I don't lose too many of you along the way. I lost three subscribers yesterday. I have no idea why, but I did. But that's okay because I do know that there are quite a few of you out there that really do like my content and I'm going to continue to do this because I do enjoy this and I enjoy talking to you. So I'm going to stop talking now and get to the end of this video. So again, if you like this, please give me a thumbs up, a possible subscribe in those comments. Let me know how you feel about my ideas for this series, if you think it's a good idea or if I should just go ahead and plug along the way I have been. I really look forward to your feedback. So once again, everyone, Thank you so much. We'll see you on the next one.